my great honor to introduce you to our today's guest from Canada, scientist Svetlana Panic. Mm -hmm. And tonight she will present uh, her lecture, uh, she will present her lecture, uh, Discovery of Jew uh, Jewish Jesus, from Moses Mendelssohn to Mark Chagall, in which she will cover the changes that occurred in Jewish culture during the 19th and 20th centuries under the influence of Kaskala movement, stimulated a widespread uh, interest to the figure of Jesus among Jewish intellectuals, writers, and artists. Uh, so we look forward to Svetlana's presentation. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. It's a very special place for me because, uh, uh, because of the dear memories of Zilvina's beloved. Thanks to him, I came here, and uh, I would uh, be. I would like this lecture to be an homage uh, to the eternal memory of Gilvinus. So um, I, I am a, a researcher from the University of Toronto, Canada, uh, and my uh, scholarship, my academic interest is connected with Jewish-Christian relations, with Jewish Christianity, and with clashes between Jewish and Christian tradition, uh, traditions that are influencing the current, mutual current misunderstanding. So mm, what I will speak about, I, mm, our main hero, of course, will be Mark Chagall. But for understanding his, um, I would say, weird, his unusual images, especially unusual for the Jewish tradition, and, uh, in, um, and provoking people to ask questions, who was your Chagall on earth? Who was he? Was he a Jew? Was he a Christian? Was he nobody else? Um, so, um, uh, before entering to the most complicated Chagall's imagery, that is the image of crucifixion, I'd like to sketch a picture of the phenomenon that started already in 18th century Europe and uh, called by scholars a Jewish discovery of Jesus. I will just say that uh, an interest to the Jewish discovery of Jesus mm, raises only maybe 20, 20, academic interest, I mean, raise, uh, raises only 20, 25 years ago. So this domain is absolutely new, both for the Jewish studies and for Christian studies. So before mm, we will concentrate on Chagall, but before, entering into the, sh sh into the Chagallian world, we will start with Moses Mendelssohn. Moses Mendelssohn, who is known as the father of Haskalah, but he was also the scene, he was also a person who probably the first in the uh, big uh, Jewish theological discourse, tried to um, clarify the Jewish attitude to the figure of Jesus. It happened uh, in debate with the Lutheran theologian John Caspar Lavater. Uh, Lavater changed the Mendel, uh, changed the uh, Jewish thinker either to disprove the truth of Christianity or to convert. For this uh, debate, Mendelssohn prepared three main points. Uh, later, mm, he will repeat them in his Opus Magnum, that is Jerusalem or on religious power in, in, and Judaism. So mm, his uh, points are as follows. First, there is no similarity between the historical person of Jesus and Christian teachings about him. Speaking differently, there is a certain gap 
between the church tradition of understanding uh, Jesus and historical person of Jesus. And as far as uh, these differently, this difference exists, uh, it explains why Jews cannot accept the divinity of Jesus and Christian doctrine. But, I quote uh, Mendelssohn, they can acknowledge the innocence and moral goodness of, of, the, of his character. Second thesis by Mendelssohn, Jesus was not a divine, a divine person. Mendelssohn refuses to recognize him as Messiah. And the third person, the third thesis, sorry, sounded as follows. Jesus was an observing Jew who kept mitzvot. He was a rabbi and moral teacher whose preaching is based on the commandments given by God to the Jews. Uh, as I said, this, uh, this point Mendelssohn develops in his main writing, uh, Jerusalem, or on religious power, to, uh, power and Judaism. This writing was addressed, addressed both to Jews and to Christians. It was written to prove that Jews are not enemies of the Christian state and Judaism does not contradict modern European legal and moral norms. And, mm, Jesus of Nazareth, wrote Mendelssohn, himself observed not only the law of Moses but also the ordinances of rabbis. And whatever seems to contradict in his speeches and acts ascribed to him appears to, to do so only at first glance. Closely examined, everything is in complete agreement not only with scripture, but also with the tradition. A point that will be only two centuries later supported by the Christian biblical scholarship, supported and developed already. It was proclaimed by Mendelssohn in the end of 18th century. The second important statement of this paper was addressed to Christians. Mendelssohn lived in uh, the something in the atmosphere that could be described as everyday anti-Semitism. So he finished his writing with the address to his Christian brothers and fellow men who follow the teachings of Jesus. Should you find fault with us for doing what the founder of your religion did himself and confirmed by his authority? Should you believe that you cannot love us in return as brothers and unite with us as citizens as long we are outwardly distinguished by you uh, from, distinguished from you by the ceremonial law do not eat with you do not marry you etc and so on and so forth it could be said that um, this was a bipolar argument addressed simultaneously to jews and christians for jews the image of Jesus was proposed as a model of the observing Jew and it should become an encouragement uh, for their own observance of the rabbinic tradition By, while for Christians the idea of Jesus as a practicing Jew was a reminder that people of the same nation as Jesus are living among them, it follows from this quote and thus Jesus, and just, and just Jesus, who was a Jew, and Jews who are uh, the relatives, in some sense, of Jesus, cannot be a subject of discrimination. Mendelssohn's position created a theological foundation for the reclaiming or discovering a figure of Jesus in Haskalah movement, 
And here we are finding one more hero uh, who, he, who was born here in Vilna, Yuda, Juda, Yuda or Juda Lib Gordon. The desire of Jewish enlightenment uh, to inscribe Jesus into Jewish theology was for Haskalah not only a theological enter enterprise, it was also an effort, um, an attempt, or even a part of the modernistic project of encounter of Jewish communities with the bigger non-Jewish world. And first of all, a world of uh, European culture, humanistic values and European culture. And the essence of this project was, in fact, uh, the best described by the poem written by Judah Leib Gordon as uh, a hymn for Haskalah movement as general, in general. Uh, he was an educator. He was a social activist. And, uh, uh, this poem became an unofficial anthem of Haskalah. It's a very interesting text. Uh, Gardon himself uh, ruled that he attempted to speak the language, I'll quote, of his audience of Eastern European Jews educated in the traditional header and schooled in the synagogal liturgies and prayers and <laughs> but the intention, uh, the content of this poem was um, something absolutely different from the traditional views of uh, the most of Eastern European Jews. <coughs> it starts uh, with the uh, exclamation, awake my people, how long will you sleep? The night has passed, the sun shines through, awake, cast your eyes hither, and you recognize your time and place. Already in the first line, in the second line of this uh, of, uh, of this poem, the se in the second line of the first stanza, we find a clear <laughs> allusion to Psalms: "The night has passed, the sun shines through." And it was a very, very conscious method, a conscious methodology uh, to use scriptural text to use psalms for proclaiming a key idea, not only by of Gardon, but also by Haskalah as it is, to be a man in the streets and a Jew at home. To be a man in, in, in the streets and Jew at home. However, this uh, recognizable uh, Jewish religious and cultural codes Used, were used also to transmit the idea of a new, awakened, educated nation open to wisdom and reason, capable and really capable to be a man in the streets and a Jew at home. The last dichotomy, a man in, in the streets and a Jew at home, is very important for Haskalah understanding of Jesus, both as a Jew in his land and as universal humanistic figure. Theological discover of um, Jewish Jesus continued in the late 18th, oh, sorry. What, I, what I'm doing, yeah. It continued um, in the late 18th, the beginning of, 20th, of 19th century by the group of the followers of Moses Mendelssohn, but as uh, the famous uh, thinker, European thinker of 20th century, Albert Schweitzer once wrote, each of them found, uh, found its own thoughts in Jesus that, echo, that would echo each epoch. So in 18th century, in the end of 18th, in the beginning of 19th century, we find two, we find a set of people who are following uh, Mendelssohn, but 
with their likes and dislikes. For instance, Isaac Marcus Joft uh, had a, a st strong dislike for rabbinic Judaism, and so he presented uh, Jewish Jesus as um, a charismatic opponent to the decadent rabbinic tradition. In his fundamental work, you see the first page of, this, of his fundamental work here. In his fundamental work, A History of Judaism and its Sects, Joft depicts uh, Jesus against the background of the Jewish society of the Second Temple period, and uh, he shows that society is degrading. It, de it degrades uh, spiritually, morally, and uh, it degrades because it is indifferent to the suffering of the most vulnerable, and Jesus comes uh, to remind his nation about the true meaning of Judaism. An observant Jew, a religious leader faithful to his nation, Jesus challenges the rabbis by his universalistic, this is a very important concept, Jesus uh, already in 18th century, um, Jesus is, Jewish Jesus is seen not a parochial, not a provincial, not as a church locked, but as a universal uh, figure who is addressing to the whole world, to the world, uh, including the world of Jews. And the next figures who continued the same line were uh, two reformed the theologians, theologians of reformed Judaism, Abraham Heiger or Geiger, as he is called sometimes, and Samuel Hirsch. They all openly said that Jesus, I'm quoting, the prototypical reformed Jew, a prophetic figure whose preaching challenges traditional Jewish ethical doctrine. And it must be accepted by the adherents of Haskalah. The same was intention of the Wissenschaft, of the Wissenschaft des Judaismus a movement, an academic movement that emerged, emerged in the midst of Jewish intellectual society. They made, in fact, they aimed to make Judaism a legitimate academic discipline integrated into the Christian scholarship. And then from here we are jumping to the beginning of, uh, to the end of 19th the beginning of 20th century, when the pioneering, oh sorry, oh, when the pioneering movement inspired by Zionist, I, Zionist ideas is starting in the land of Israel. And here we found one uh, of the most interesting figures in the Jewish discovery of Jesus, Joseph Klausner, and again, Klausner is also from this land. Klausner was uh, born in uh, Valkininkai. In, the Vilna, in, in fact, uh, it was a Vilnius Krashtas. Uh, yes, uh, how, how many kilometers? Uh, about 40. Oh, wonderful. Uh, so, uh, he, um, Uh, an a Jewish intellectual with a solid philosophical background received in Heidelberg University, uh, a perfect uh, scholar of um, Semitic languages. He was one of those pioneers, Zionist pioneers, who came to Palestine in 1910. In 1922, He published his opus magnum, Jesus of Nazareth, his life, times, and teaching, in which, as he stated in the introduction, you know, I, uh, he wants to give the Hebrew people, I'm sorry, here, okay, he want, in, in, the, uh, in the introduction, he described the intention 
of uh, this work that was called Jesus of Nazareth, his lifetimes and teaching. So he wanted to give the Hebrew people a Hebrew book that will tell the story of Jesus in Hebrew. Until this day, there was no book on the Jewish Jesus in Hebrew. The kind of book that has no Christian missionary goal to convert Jesus to Christianity or nor Jewish religious goal to keep the Jews away from Christianity. Uh, the, uh, what was, uh, but what was the most important for our context is that Klausner's book initiated a discussion about so-called new Jew, uh, who, as Klausner's uh, contemporary Joseph Chaim Brenner described, he has no exilic conscience of the Eastern European Jews suppressed by um, the dominating culture. Brenner contrasted the Sikh Eastern European Jews with the bold masculine, I'm quoting, image of a new Jew who should be stronger than rock, who should labor and be productive as much as possible. For Zionist Klausner, the ideal model of this Jew was Jesus. And besides all, the, his figure was attractive also because, as Klausner puts it, he, Jesus was bone from bone and flesh from flesh of the land of Israel. So he portrays him as a native Jew nourished by the background of the biblical landscape. And here I would propose a, a beautiful poetical um, quote. The, ma the majestic beauty of, the, of this place was an ape aspiring sight and must, even without his knowledge, he have exerted an influence of Jesus. There, uh, cut off by mountains from the great world, wrapped up in natural beauty, a beauty tender and peaceful, sorrowful in its peacefulness, and within the nation of land workers who asked for nothing, Jesus had become a dreamer and a visionary whose thoughts turned to his people's future, to the heavy Roman yoke, and most of all, to the sorrows of the individual soul and to the kingdom of God. And again, it's important that for Klausner, the social aspect of Jesus is even more significant than theological one. In the second half of the 19th century, the discovery of Jewish Jesus starts also in the Eastern Europe, where, due to the anti-Semitic position of the dominant churches, and uh, the traditional Jewish uh, vision of Jesus uh, as Yoshke, his figure was rather hostile. His figure was rather threatening. And we see a lot of examples in the Yiddish um, prose, in the Yiddish literature of that period, starting from Sholom Aleichem. Um, but it should be a separate uh, uh, theme for the separate, uh, for the separate However, when in the middle of the uh, uh, 19th century, uh, Jewish public activists started to meet with Russian public activists, uh, many of whom identified themselves as non-church Christians, the attitude to the figure of Jesus began to change. Those Russian non-church <coughs> non Christian thinkers opposed the traditional anti-Semitic and triumphant official theology with the principles of the social Christianity, with the theology of Jesus of poor, Jesus of beggars, manifested first of all in uh, the Russian poetry, in the Russian literature depicting Jesus uh, in the guise of servant wandering around uh, Russia and, of course, by uh, the Russian art, first of all, by the famous biblical 
paintings uh, of Nikolai Ge. Ge is not accidental figure here. As we know, he was that painter who influenced Mark Antokolsky, who influenced Mark Chagall. Uh, and so this composition, what is truth, again, as we know, and first Jewish sculpture who was born here <laughs> again in Antakhenis, uh, this composition was used by Mark Antokolsky uh, as a challenge to the, his anti-Semitic critics asking him how the Jewish artists can depict our Christian tradition. No, said Antokolsky in his letters uh, to uh, Stasov, uh, art critic Stasov, who supported him. No, this is not your Christian Jesus. This is, first of all, a Jewish Jesus, and I would like him to look like a Jew. But coming back to the Rus to the Russian dis to the uh, discovery of Jesus in among the Russian Jews, what else uh, is interesting? Okay, uh, Russian activism or общественники. Uh, there is a wonderful research about it written by Simon Rabinovich from Stanford University. Well, Russian activists or общественники emphasized the social perspective of Jesus' teaching and practice. And so it is understandable why these ideas mm, appear to be attractive to the, first of all, to the Russian Jewish socialist revolutionaries. And first of all, to one of the most, I would say, one of the most brilliant persons among them, one of the founders of this, uh, par uh, of this party, a promoter of the Jewish autonomism, a defender of the Yiddish culture, a uh, really marvelous person, Chaim Zhotovsky. Uh, I think uh, it, would, it would be my dream to give a talk about, a separate talk about Zaltovsky because he is worthy. So, uh, Chaim Zaltovsky was, uh, Chaim Zaltovsky, Chaim Zaltovsky was an absolutely, Chaim Zaltovsky was an absolutely secular person. He never declared his religious position. Nevertheless, he wrote that for him, Jewish was, uh, for him, sorry, for him, Jesus was, I quote, the first Jewish <coughs> socialist revolutionary and the first Jewish martyr. But he was not alone, even for Dubnov, you know, who cannot accept his daughter Olga after, he, after she became Christian, he cannot uh, accept her uh, during more than 10 years. Nevertheless, for him, as he said in the interview to the American Jewish magazine, Jesus was a very important figure of uh, Jewish history. In 1909, Zetlovsky enters into discussion with another incredible person who is directly connected with this location, with this place, um, an author of the book. The second version of the book was written here in the uh, hotel that was located in this building. So, uh, uh, Simon Ansky. The debate, a, a year-long debate, uh, was uh, about a desirability and acceptability of using Christian images in the Jewish art. The most disputable question was the image of crucifixion that, uh, as we know, was uh, completely rejected by the traditional Jewish thinking as uh, something hostile, something associated rather with pogroms. 
And that is why, as far as the key point was an issue, a key point was an image of crucifixion. This debate was called in the Jewish periodicals a crucifixion question. Uh, so the positions were distinctive, distinctively opposite. Ansky said no, it is not possible for Jews to use Christian images in their art. Zetlovsky said yes, it is possible because, as he wrote, uh, it was a symbol of Jewish martyrdom. That martyrdom is continuing until now. But I think the most convincing artistic answer to this question was given by Mark Chagall. Before starting to look at Chagall's uh, images of cross, images of crucifixion, I should say something that probably all of you know. For as you know, Chagall's birth name was Moisha, Moses Chagall. He accepted the pseudonym Mark, only living in Paris, uh, approximately in uh, 1913. Why Mark? Because he understood himself as a follower of Mark Antokolsky. Antokolsky was for him his teacher in art and also his spiritual teacher. Uh, Chagall was uh, brought up as a child. Chagall was brought up in, Lubav in Hasidic, in Lubavitcher Hasidic uh, setting that was rather influential in the Jewish, uh, uh, in the big uh, Jewish community of that time. Uh, and it, but, and it is so, sometimes it looks, it sounds strange that sh a crucifixion was for him one of the most powerful, and moreover, it was one of the first artistic impressions. As uh, I, the best biographer of Chagall, Benjamin Harshav, who also was born in Lithuania, um, uh, once pointed out a geographical factor uh, played uh, in uh, Chagall's attraction to, cru to the image of crucifixion a considerable role. Wicked, uh, Harshal wrote, uh, was located at the crossroad of, the, of three empires, the powerful yet backward pre revolutionary Russian Empire the separate ex-territorial Jewish cultural empire within an empire and the metaphorical empire of European art. The atmosphere and the ethos of Vygotsk was created by diversity of ethnicities and religious traditions who, uh, that historically existed in this place where Jews, Poles, Russians, Russians, Catholics, Protestants, um, Orthodox, uh, Reformed Jews, uh, or, uh, Hasidim, Mitnagdim were neighbors for centuries. Uh, the, uh, what is most interesting that the location of the house where Chagall was born and spent many years also was significant. His house was located and is located now, there is a museum there, uh, is located at Pakrovskaya Street. This street became a permanent topos and a source of Chagall visual self quotes, all that images of Vygotsk that we see on Chagall's uh, pictures, all of them are duplicate, repeat and repeat and repeat the images of Pakrovska Street. The street was named after the Church of the Holy Protection of Theotokos in Russian Pakrov. And uh, uh, this church was situated 
in the end of the street, not far from uh, Chagall's family house. Nearby also there was a, a Hasidic shul. Uh, uh, parents of Mark Chagall were connected with it. Obviously, uh, for the Eastern European Jew of the end of 19th, the beginning of 20th century, church was, first of all, a dangerous place associated with pogroms, but at the same time, it was a rather attractive setting. Uh, it, was attract, uh, it was attractive by its strange beauty and by its otherness, dangerous and attractive. And this, ten this tension between danger and attractiveness is reflected in many, in a lot of uh, Jewish poetry, and especially in a lot of Hebrew poetry, Uri Tzvi Greenberg, who is calling uh, Jesus my brother, and at the same time he speaks about those who kill, he, those who kill his brother in the big temples in the big church. Uh, so, uh, for uh, Chagall venturing inside the church, for young Chagall, for a Jewish boy Chagall, uh, venturing inside the church was a tantalizing act. It was an act of transgression of the family traditions, family was strictly observed, but you see, it is possible to see that from his young years, he found himself uh, not only, uh, he found himself artistically, not only in the Jewish tradition, but in, in between two traditions, Jewish and Christian. And this intermediary position, as we'll see, shaped his approach to the biblical narrative and images. His first image of crucifixion, Chagall made already in 1908, when he was a young school. Uh, in fact, he was a young schoolboy. Uh, and I, unfortunately, I could not find this image. Um, it was published by Susan um, uh, Tamarkin uh, in the catalog of the big uh, Chagall's exhibit uh, that uh, was uh, that took place uh, ten years ago in the Metropolitan, no, in the in New York Jewish Museum, yes. But uh, uh, what did uh, so so I should describe it? It was a simple copy of uh, um, the classical Orthodox iconography, crucifixion with supplicants. This iconography, Chagall so just copied it, but. What? <laughs> so it's funny uh, to describe a drawing as it is a, as in the famous joke Rabinovich Napiel, uh, but uh, so I will try to do, to do it. What did Chagall uh, <coughs> make? He copied this traditional iconography with the crucified Jesus, Mary, Mary and Apostle. But, and, but he adds something to this iconography. Uh, the only recognizable Chagallian detail, detail there is a man who carries, uh, who carries out a ladder. We will find this figure also here. Uh, a figure that will repeatedly appear in many Chagall's pieces. In 1912, already being in Paris, already, as we see here, being influenced by Cubism, being influenced by Picasso, he makes his second attempt to depict crucifixion. He calls it Golgotha, but the previous name of this picture was dedicated to Christ. He uses the same compositions of crucifixion with supplicants, but 
Look at this. Um, I will take this one. <laughs> but look at these figures. These two who are standing, uh, <coughs> who are standing at the cross, uh, at their places where traditionally Theotokos and Apostle are depicted, these are Jewish figures. These are typically Jewish figures, a man in a cartoon, in a, in a traditional Jewish hat, and a woman. Uh, Susan Demarkin, uh, I think the best researcher of the crucifixion motifs in Chagall's art, uh, suggested that most probably, oh, sorry, what should I do with it? Ah, okay. Uh, he suggested uh, that most probably Chagall minded that these two figures, I probably will quote, are claimed to be his own parents. In some early sketches of the same painting, he replaced the inscription on the top of the cross with his own name. It is important for Chagall. He will use this uh, uh, method, he will use this image repeatedly in 1930. In fact, uh, it was his first artistic declaration about his attitude to the biblical narrative and especially to the image of crucifixion. Similar to many Jewish artists and writers who lived in, in the Eastern Europe, for Chagall, the Bible was not a book about them. It was a book about us. A book, I would call, of memoir about his ancestors. And he did not illustrate it when we are speaking about Chagall's biblical illustrations. Uh, sometimes we are making an error because Chagall did not illustrate Bible in the traditional European style. He was not a Jewish Durer. Uh, he, but he rather created something that I would propose to call a visual midrash. A visual midrash, a narrative about narrative, that a narrative that embraces biblical history, that embraces it into the intimate Jewish world. His vision of biblical events, not as glorious or not as sorrowful past, but for him, biblical history is a living and challenging now a domain of his personal identification, or speaking differently, it is a narrative frame in which common and private history is inscribed. And this idea of uh, biblical paintings as, as a visual midrash, I think can, can, be, can be one of the basic keys to these paintings, including the images of crucifixion. Uh, even more evident even, even more evident personification with crucified Jesus is revealed in Chagall's pictures of 1930s. The piece executed as a response of the escalating Nazi persecution of Jews. It's interesting. Uh, his last crucifixion war, let's call it like this, his last prayer war crucifixion is 1912, then a big gap, and then in 1930, starting from the middle of 1930, he constantly addresses, to, repeats the same um, theme of the crucified Jew. It was, uh, for him, it was, that time for him, it was first of all a symbol that would be accessible and easily understood as a plea for help. And at the same time, 
This symbol obtains a very clear personal connotations. Here, I, mm, mm, is it possible to turn on of lights? Yes, because uh, uh, something should be seen here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, this image obtains a very distinct, very clear personal connotations. Uh, his, one of his first paintings of 1938, the artist with yellow uh, Christ presents himself, the figure of himself sitting at the cross, at the foot of the cross, at that place where in the traditional iconography a postal usually sits. Uh, so, you know, of, uh, no doubt, the image of yellow uh, Christ or yellow Jesus was influenced by Gauguin. Gauguin, yellow Jesus, but Ch uh, well, Chagall was influenced by everyone. Uh, yes, he liked to be influenced, especially when he studied in France. He, it's a, for him, it was a very conscious position of a pupil, of a disciple of everyone. And of course, he takes almost the same composition as we see the guest yellow Jesus, but he places himself at the foot of the cross. Uh, he never spoke about his religious affiliation. Uh, publicly, he identified himself either or uh, either as a self-critical Jew, he wrote him about himself as a self-critical Jew, or as a French or Russian painter. But in his poetry of 1909-1910, he openly named Names himself a pupil not only of a, a European artistic tradition, but also a pupil of Jesus. I'm his high pupil, he writes. I'm his high pupil hanging in tandem. We are lonely. We are lonely forever from the morning. I was a sign. My destiny is on the cross. The same motif is developed and repeated in the Yiddish poem Chagall wrote the same year when artist with yellow Christ was depicted. Uh, the title of this poem was Meine Tränen. My tears, and it, in, it is based, in fact, on the direct allusion to Jesus' words on the cross. I quote, I carry my cross every day. I am led by the lamp and driving on. Night darkens around me. Why have you abandoned me, my God? Why? The last line is a direct, direct gospel quote. I'm sorry, it's words of Chagall? <laughs> yes, oh. yes, yes, it's, it's of Chagall. At what year? 1938. The same year, uh, it's interesting, oh. the same year when he depicted artists uh, uh, with yellow Christ, and the same year he depicted uh, the famous uh, white crucifixion. We will tell. We'll uh, speak a little about it. It is evident that for him, Jesus was, first of all, as, as for the same as for Haskalah thinkers, Jesus was, first of all, a universal, a most powerful, and all embracing image of human suffering. The poem, My Tears, is interesting also because it raises the question about the meaning of art in catastrophic time. How, Chagall asks, and what is, uh, is it possible to paint 
in the midst of cities that burn, brothers who flee in the dark of night. The end uh, of the quote. The answer for him, for him, the answer came two years later in 1914 when he makes uh, his less popular, less known painting, The Painter Crucified. Uh, it sheds the light uh, on the connection between Chagall's artistic self-identity and his understanding of, crucified, of the crucified Jesus. The artist, as we see, is depicted on the cross. His left hand is nailed. In the right hand, he has a palette with brushes. The shade is visible on the cross. In, in this sense, he, he, is, he, is, he depicts the artist with his recognizable face features um, like associating him with the crucified Jesus. About the painter, artist is associated with crucified Jesus not uh, in his uh, uh, not uh, in his life, but first of all in his art. He is co-crucified with his art. About him. Uh, there are two hands, uh, um, two blessing, uh, two hands. They are blessing artists with the traditional priestly benediction, and this symbol, uh, this symbol introduces one more connotation. The crucified artist is understood by Chagall also as a priestly figure. A priestly benediction, uh, this benediction is given only to priests. Art, the crucified artist is understood as an intermediary, as an intercessory, priestly figure advocating before God for the suffering, for the sufferings of the world. And this world is symbolized here by the uh, inverted Stetten houses. Look, the <coughs> are completely inverted and by the strange semi-anthropomorphical <coughs> female uh, figure. The semantic parallel to this figure of the crucified artist is a painting of entombment. Here. Uh, a painting of entombment, entombment placed on the easel in the right corner of um, this picture. As of <coughs> one of the most interesting contemporary researchers of uh, the uh, Christian uh, images in the Jewish art, uh, Matthew Hoffman once wrote, this, mm, uh, this parallel, I quote, with uh, the Christian image of Christ's burial entombment meant that while the historical Jesus is dead and buried, others, like the artist himself, now should sacrifice themselves and suffer in the same fashion that Jesus once did. It's very interesting observation and very, I think, a um, very precise observation. So we should take it because If one would look at Chagall's poetry and Chagall's notes of 1930, um, she or he would find that for him the central mission of the artist at this time is to be co-sufferer, to suffer with humans. So um, the artistic vocation is not just a readiness to become a victim, a victim, but an understanding of art as a self-offering. An artist stri is, uh, strives to depict Jesus, 
you need Jesus as a symbol of the individual sacrifice and thus de de depicting him, the artist has to be co-crucified with him. One of uh, uh, Chagall's biographers, Franz uh, Mark, Franz, uh, Franz Mark Mayer, uh, wrote about this picture that the figure of the artist on the cross is personalized as a symbol of intensification and deepening of the pain of every single individual represented as the pain felt by the painter himself. This pain is felt by the painter himself through his sympathy with the fate of his nation and the horrors of the war. At the same time, it becomes a symbol of the pain inherited in the artistic creation. Mayer's argument, uh, I think, uh, explains why crucifixion uh, became the, uh, one of the most predominant images in Chagall's art. First of all, for him, it was a direct way to express his vision of Jewishness as a solidarity. As a solidarity with the pain and suffering of, uh, of every single creature, every single person, and at the same time, this is a solidarity, a very sharp solidarity with his persecuted nation. It is especially evident in his famous white crucifixion, very interesting and very, very complicated masterpiece, very complicated work. Uh, here, Chagall uses the same image of crucifixion, but transforms it, but he transforms it into the powerful uh, Jewish, into the powerful Jewish symbol. He does it not only by linking it with the iconic Jewish details and self quotes from his previous works. You see, it is a big quote. This old white, white crucifixion is a big quote. The same Chagall's beggar, the same Chagall's flying Jews uh, who are prophets and uh, uh, holy mothers, uh, the same Chagall, the same inhabitants of the same Chagallian status. Uh, but you, you see here a Jew. Mm, you see uh, here a scroll, uh, uh, books, uh, Jew, with a Jew with Torah, uh, fly again, uh, flying Moses, uh, a fiddler. We see here a fiddler. We see here a synagogue. It's very interesting. In, in the beginning of 1930s, Chagall was in Vilna. And he made a huge, a marvelous picture of Vilna Synagogue. Here he repeats its composition. But this synagogue is burning. Uh, of, and what is the most important, he is focused on the symbolism of violence. Thus, on the one of, of, of violence, of suffering, thus, on the one hand, eliminating the theological meaning of hope, salvation, and stressing it by the centrality of the uh, figure of crucified. Why, um, why crucifixion was depicted in 1938 after Chaga, uh, as a response to Kristallnacht and uh, as a response uh, to the news about the extermination of the German Jews. In this uh, painting, as we saw, uh, this Jewish world is falling apart. Those who inhabited, um, uh, those who inhabited for centuries, 
these shadows run off in a different direction. Sacred scrolls and books are scattered. All the people who read them, you see, uh, scrolls and books are scattered. All the people who read them are scattered too. Houses are falling down and burning. Uh, all signs of the previous Jewish life are vandalized or destroyed. The synagogue is desecrated. You see, this is a certain parallelism with Bolsheviks' desecration of the traditional Jewish life and Nazis' desecration. Uh, the images, uh, these parallel images of the soldiers with red flag in the left corner and a very strange image of the burning synagogue in the right corner. Uh, however, this world that is falling apart is pulled together by the central figure of uh, Jesus as a Jew in a long cloth made from the Jewish towels. Uh, this intimacy between uh, a Jew on the cross and Jewish catastrophe became even more visible in Chagall's paintings of the early 1940s. Uh, thus, uh, in The Crucified, it's very interesting uh, that uh, this painting is called not as not uh, crucifixion, although crucifixion still the same, uh, the main, still the main image of this painting, but the crucified at Raspiati. He, he named it in Russian. The, cru the crucified was uh, painted after Chagall learned about the extermination of wicked Jews. And so the figure, more or less iconic figure of the Jewish um, Jesus on the cross is substituted by the typical Eastern European Jew. by the typical figure of the individual martyrdom in a typical Eastern European Jew, Jewish children, Jew, and a long line of the crucified people, a world that became a huge a lo a long the endless Golgotha. And here again we see a typical Chagall's self quote from his earlier paintings. This is his Meshuge, a man who is sitting on the roof. His strange figure, his wanderer, sometimes he is depicted with Torah, sometimes he is depicted with his fiddle or with, with his bed, but here he is depicted with bloody Torah, with bloody scroll. Red blood, red bloody scroll. Uh, it is this, <coughs> this vision, this understanding of Chagall, this Chagall's understanding of uh, Holocaust as a crucifixion of the whole, of the world of the Eastern European Jewry, of the world of the Eastern European uh, Jewish culture and Jewish thought, as he wrote uh, to his uh, friend Joseph, uh, Yiddish writer Joseph Patoshu in the end of 1940s, we re uh, when Chagall already was in the United States, uh, we remained alone. Our world is destroyed. Our images are kept only in our minds. But, uh, but his interpretation of, this, of the destruction of this world is, was one of the visual resources uh, for 
the formulating of the Jewish, both Jewish and Christian theology of Shah. And last, Chagall's crucifixion appears in 1950. A so-called mystical crucifixion that is a contamination of many Chagall's images, a port of clothes, his permanent image of the mother of God, his permanent image of the statue, but look, uh, the image of crucified Jew is brought to the corner. Who is in the corner? A red captor. An image of the pure sacrifice, of the pure offering, that only offering that can purify and sustain this world. And it was the end of Chagall's message of crucifixion. It was his dream. Thank you. It was my question too. And for me, it was. Uh, you, you, you mean. Uh, wait, wait, please. You mean that flag in the corner? Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, for me, this is a big and unsolved problem. Because all uh, historians of art, all Chagallian scholars, try not to mention it. They avoid speaking about it. But for me, my, my suggestion, maybe I'm wrong. You see, this is, mm, this is a sketch, this is a copy of Vilna Synagogue. I'm right? sorry, but Vilna says it's Poland. Yes, Vilna is Poland. But in Chagall's mind, after 19, 40, when Vilna was occupied. But it's uh, dated in Yes, 19, it, it is dated in 1938, right. Yes. So my, may, may I tell you about my suggestion? Uh, for Chagall, it, I think that uh, for him, Vilna was a sort of a mixture, a cultural mixture. Mm -hmm. He's not a historian, he's an artist. And so he mix, he, he could mix Polish, Vilna, and this place as a place of Vilna Gaon, who is associated for him with Lithuania. I, I was thinking also, you see, in 1938, He could not know about the cases of, uh, about the anti-Semitic cases because you, as you said, as you rightly said, Vilna was Poland, was a Poland. What, um, I can only guess why he depicted Lithuanian there. I don't, you, if you have any suggestions? No, I don't. We have only questions, but I, uh, and, uh, he never mentioned that. He never mentioned that. It's, it's really weird because usually he commented his paintings a lot. In, in, uh, uh, in his private correspondence in Yiddish, uh, when he was uh, uh, in touch uh, in, in 1970s, for instance, when his big exhibit was prepared in Moscow, he had a huge correspondence in Russian. And white crucifixion also was um, exhibited here, there, but he never commented this. 
and the and Harshav also never uh, uh, Harshav, who is his uh, best biographer, uh, never alluded to this plan. I think uh, I would say that it is a niche, a niche of uh, you know why I'm thinking about an issue of uh, cultural mixture. Chagall, <laughs> Chagall was not a historian. His my biography is a is a fiction biography. He mixed uh, a variety of events of his biography into the same strange composition as he did uh, in uh, his painting. And I could suggest that for him, Polish, Lithuanian symbols of Vilna as it is, of Vilna as Vilna, could, uh, could make a sort of a mixture. You don't, you don't It's see. absolutely impossible. That, in fact, is written in different years. Uh, it's never, uh, never existed in Vilnius then. Uh, but it existed in Kaunas. It's a, uh, right. Uh, but, but it existed as, as a Lithuanian plan. Uh, as, uh, for 20 years. Just for not, 20 oh, not years. only for 20 years. Uh, then, uh, but in the period was not created in Roman. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm speaking about the reality of, uh, let's say, his life. As far as I remember, he didn't visit Kaunas. He never, he didn't visit uh, Kaunas. He never was in Lithuania. <laughs> he was. He was. Well, he went from Moscow. Yes. He, Went away, both to Shai, yes, yes, to go away to the West, and uh, in Konas he had exhibition. In Gonas. Yes, yes, it, it's and so, but, he, but after that, this exhibition but, uh, can uh, uh, see this. Yes, like absolutely. Later. After about, um, after he, uh, in nineteen, it was it was in the middle in uh, the beginning of nineteen twenties after Chagall made decorations uh, for uh, Granovsky's Jewish uh, theater in Moscow, thanks to Balto Chaiki, yes. he could escape. Yes. And, and many of those who escaped through, who escaped thanks to Balto Chaikis and the Lithuanian embassy, that time he escaped yes. to Kaunas. And, and, so, and so that he was a mixture. He, he could, mm, he could yeah, I would say, he could substitute in different images the same as he substituted different facts of even, uh, even of his own biography. by Susan Tamarkin, uh, he associated himself with Jesus, yes. but he never, uh, he never confessed himself as a Christian. Mm -hmm. But he had personal relationship he, he, with yes, Jesus. Yes, absolutely, but, he had, but what is important, he had his personal relationship yes. not with Jesus of the Christian domain. Mm -hmm. 
not with Jesus of like Christian classes. theology, mm -hmm. but with Jewish Jesus. For him, Jesus was first of all a Jew. Mm -hmm. he, his, his personal yes. Jew, I would say. Don't you think uh, that uh, this symbol was uh, chosen by him in his paintings to communicate somehow with the Christian community? Yes, for sure, and he wrote about it. He wrote that white crucifixion was addressed, first of all, to the, uh, to the European, I ever even tried to remind his, uh, his words, it was addressed to the European Christian community as an appeal, he uses this word, appeal, as an appeal to stop uh, Jewish tragedy. And so he repeatedly, you see, I have shown only, only a few of his crucifixions of 1930s, but he repeatedly uh, painted and painted and painted crucifixions until 1950. It was a, when you are looking at his sketches, and even, you know, when in 1952, he was invited again to make uh, uh, sketches for the new uh, French edition of scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, he painted his exo exodus. But his... Uh, <coughs> um, But on one of the sketches to the Exodus, a crowd, a Jewish crowd is led not by Moses, but by a figure on the cross. This uh, uh, sketch can be found in the internet, I have linked it here. And um, he, he wrote himself that he is obsessed by the crucifixion because he sees it as the most eloquent as the most powerful way to cry to the society that claims to be Christian. Mm. I'm sorry, I want to ask uh, one another crucifixion uh, where were two blue clouds and uh, two hands, uh, uh, one yellow and yes. one red, that were b blessing. That is a light. But, but it's interesting what they mean, these two hands. One red and one uh, uh, yellow, palms of hand, from, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, from I'm blue clouds. It was 1940. Yes, 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 yes. Um, crucified artist, yes. Yes, yes. 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 Uh, you mean um, this one? Yes. Uh, for um, in Sagarian symbolism of colors, both yellow, and red are colors of light. Ah, okay. Yes, these are symbolical representations of uh, of the fullness of life. Mm -hmm. Like shalom. Like shalom. Uh, like shina. Shina. Like shina, I would say. But uh, it's not Jewish blessing. It's a, it, first. Uh, this is a priestly Jewish blessing. But, uh, But yes, uh, to uh, hear. Right. it's one God. Right. Yes. Uh, and uh, you know, if you would look at the priestly blessing on the synagogue decorations, you will find a variety of camp positions, especially in the East Europe. But usually, it's uh, well, well, well fingered like this. Not always. Uh, I said usually. Not <laughs> always, but, but <laughs> not always. <laughs> Star Wars it was taken from Jewish symbolism. <laughs> 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 so, so if there are no questions, thank you for the discussion. <laughs>